When you think of a desert, you don't often think of a body of water. But the Great Salt Lake is just that. A desert lake. A lake that doesn't provide potable water and holds 10 times more salt than the ocean. When you add to all of that a passionate kayaker taking on a first ever expedition across its waters, you've got an adventure. In 2013, Becky Richens decided to paddle the length and back of the Great Salt Lake. She didn't know it at the time, but if she were to succeed, she would be the first person to ever do so. Oh, shit. <laughs> I, being a relatively new filmmaker, jumped at the chance to document her journey. I don't think either one of us really knew what we were getting ourselves into. I went on a canoeing trip in 2011 in July and I had a friend who was kayaking that whole thing and I wanted to learn how to kayak so later that fall I went on KSL.com and bought myself a $150 11 foot special that I named Old Blue. I saw antelope and I dragged my boat and at first I didn't have any sort of rack for my truck so I just shoved that 11 footer out the back end of a very tiny quarter ton truck which looked kind of funny and threw it in the water and without a skirt, without a PFD, without anything really, I went out to Antelope and then I came back. Well, I figured that if I could get to Antelope, I could probably get, or to Antelope and back, I probably could get to the top of Antelope. And if I could get to the top of Antelope, I could probably get to the top of the southern uh, arm, finger, whatever they call it. And I figured if I can get from there to there, I could probably do the upper half. And then it was like, well, I could probably do the whole thing. And so an idea was born, but Becky needed advice from someone who knew exactly what the Great Salt Lake was capable of. Meet Dave Shear. If anyone knows anything about the Great Salt Lake, it's him. Dave and his dog Taz protect these salty waters and know just about every inch of what goes on on the lake. Great Salt Lake's about 75 miles long from northwest to southeast, and at the widest spot, it's 40 miles wide. It's the largest lake west of the Mississippi. There's never been any recorded uh, person paddling the whole length of Great Salt Lake that I've ever found. The lake is cut in half by a railroad causeway, and so you have what's called uh, Gunnison Bay and Gilbert Bay. The south half of Great Salt Lake is called Gilbert Bay. It's about 15% salt right now. The north half is called Gunnison Bay, and it's about 27% salt right now. In fact, it's at saturation point, the water won't hold the salt anymore, and it's red up there. The lake is actually like paddling in pink lemonade. Somebody that's doing a kayak, you have to be uh, cognizant of the currents. People don't uh, realize this, but Great Salt Lake is so big, and we have the three rivers that flow in here, that we actually have current on the lake, and those currents can be substantial, especially this time of year, late spring, the currents are flowing pretty strong, and that could pose a, a challenge to the kayakers. Uh, the other thing, the most serious thing, is just the weather. You know, the weather out here, it can come up pretty quickly. The waves 
can get very big. The water is denser than any, anywhere else on Earth, so a four-foot wave here will hit you with a lot more energy than a four-foot wave on the ocean. And of course, the waves out here, they'll get eight to 10 foot. We call them box wave because they're so steep, deep, and very close together. Great Salt Lake, even though it's a body of water, it's basically a desert. You can't drink the water. In fact, if you do start drinking the water because there's so much salt in it, it'll uh, dehydrate you much more quickly than just sitting out in, the, uh, out in the desert. I mean, it's not just like going out on something flat that's always going to remain flat, that's always going to be re remaining the right temperature. Sometimes it's rainy, sometimes it's been snowing, sometimes it's been really choppy, choppy that it's like throwing six foot waves, which you wouldn't expect because it's just a little late. I don't know, when you say I'm going to go out and paddle in the water one day, you think it's always going to be like the first day that you went out there where it was flat and beautiful and perfect and it's not always like that. Sometimes it's really crappy weather. We had planned and researched every bit of Becky's journey. The only thing left to do was to launch. I think that's called Elephant Rock. I don't know. I haven't read the map very well. And then just over there is where I'm landing. It's about seven miles away from me right now. I've come somewhere between 14 and 16 miles. I'm not really sure. Anywho, on my way.
it's the end of the first day. Um, I'm having to sneak this in the tent because the bugs are um, evil and eating me alive out there. I went to the bathroom and nearly got eaten by a mosquito the size of a hawk. Um, but beyond that, it was a really successful first day. And a lot of um, ambivalent moments at the beginning because of such strong winds got really choppy right coming out of the marina and it made me a little nervous because I was like that really needs to slow down and it did finally slow down um, as I got to the south end of Antelope and uh, the winds died down a bit and it got a little bit warmer um, some really beautiful moments there were uh, at one point I was halfway to the island when I saw some buffalo and I went pretty excited. I, I got some amazing footage mostly of just me freaking out about how exciting it was. Buffalo. You might not be able to see them from here since they're like a mile away but buffalo out there. There's Let's see. Buffalo. Saw a white rock for the first time today. Saw the north side of Antelope Island for the first time today. Saw my first buffalo on Antelope Island today. So a lot of firsts. Um, I'm hoping the rest of the time that I'm out there uh, will be equally successful. I think today it was the monotony of being out there for 20 some odd miles was cut. Uh, significantly by the fact that there were so many interesting variances and things to look at. I won't be as blessed in future ports because uh, there's just not that much to look at in the north end. <laughs> um, that, I mean that's not necessarily true. The spiral jetty is pretty amazing. And I gotta keep that in mind as I'm going across the evil Rosal Bay. Um, anyway. Uh, I'm gonna hit the sack. I'm pretty tired. <laughs> so I've checked the local forecast. And Monday is supposed to be 20 mile an hour winds coming from the south, which can get kind of dodgy. I mean, I am going north, so they'd be at coming from my back. And that's nice, but um, if it changes directions at all, that could be really scary because a lot of parts of Rosal Bay, getting to Rosal Bay, are in shallow water. And the more shallow the water, the more it uh, kicks up that water and makes it super dangerous and I could flip so I'm gonna have to watch my P's and Q's on that and it's supposed to be 100 degrees so 100 degrees 20 mile an hour winds something that every tornado wants to hear <laughs> and microburst wants to hear oh, it's scary conditions I'm not so much worried about the temperature, although it'll be miserable, but I am, I am worried about the wind. Are you ready for this? Okay. So, that's Fremont Island just across the bay, and that's not where I'm going. <laughs> just to the west and north of it, that little tip way out there. That's where I'm going, the little tip way out there. There I'll sit, I'll admit that I was only just a girl. And they don't reprimand their daughters. Right, young women, sick of swimming. And ready to stand. <laughs> I'm letting go. I'm letting go. It's a history that never really grows. I'm letting go. I'm letting go. 
like a fully loaded boat on sand. So I made it to Fremont Island. It's pretty crazy. I'm at the northern tip. I'm about to do the last seven miles of day two. I don't even think you can see my destination from here because I'm around a rock. Anyway, look what I found. Isn't that crazy? I'm really sad I can't put this on my boat. I would totally take it home and put it on my mantle and be like, booyah. Alas, I can't really afford the weight. It weighs a ton. Getting a little hot out here. Pretty tired. Those last 11 miles took a lot more out of me than I thought they would. Anywho, uh, better get back in the water. shrimp to finish up being not dehydrated. I nearly got stung by a bee about a half an hour ago and that was really scary since I am deathly allergic to them and my EpiPen was already stashed in my cargo hold so that would have been a fun scramble and a quick end of the trip. Part of me is thinking I just have to survive two more days to make history. I, I'm just really tired right now. Gotta go another 10 miles. I'm going to Indian Cove tonight. Um, hopefully to stave off the brutal weather that's going to happen tomorrow. With 100 degrees and 21 miles an hour, I'm just thinking that's gonna be hellacious best it'd be best for me to just knock out those 10 miles now which is really just the saddest story I could tell myself or you anywho um, I am hopefully gonna be eating some dinner here soon so adios for now
but it's a beautiful sunset, so I thought I'd get some footage of it before it went away. It's crazy to me, it's almost 9 o'clock. So this is where I spent the night last night, up in Indian Cove. It's actually pretty nice, I slept pretty well. Uh, what I found was interesting though was that last night it was so pitch black but for like maybe two beacons way out there, like 20 miles from me. and then. I tried to find, uh, you'll see these rocks over here, um, I kept slamming into these because the only thing that I had for sight was my GPS, uh, I'm really glad I had that, or I would have had no idea where I was going because it was completely pitch black. Um, in any case, I've got, let's see about 10 miles to go this morning and then I'll call it quits at Rosal Bay slash Spiral Jetty and I'm pretty tired that 28 miler was pretty grueling I'm glad I had a break to take a bath and things like that at a promontory otherwise I think I I don't think I would have been able to make it up here Time to take down camp and head out. Oh, this is, this is such a mental game. It's so far beyond what you expect. Anywho. I want you to notice something. It's supposed to be 20 mile an hour winds right now, right? That is placid! There's nothing out there. It's going to be e the easiest 10 miles ever. Ugh. Swear word. Okay, so when I got here today, I got to the top of Rosal Bay and I hit a sandbar and then I lost my paddle and uh, I had to get out of the boat a couple times. I swore profusely. I swore a lot because I thought I was gonna die and I lost my paddle. And I was really angry that I lost my paddle and I hit the same freaking sandbar that a lot I hit the last time and even now as I speak about it, it makes me angry. But it really is an amazing, wonderful place. When you come here, I, I mean, you can see 50 pelicans coming over the top of this mountain area right here. And then you've got the spiral jetty in the background. And it's just it's one of the most magical places on the planet. And I feel lucky that, I don't know, I know about it. Despite battling a killer bee, be free! <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> and sleeping next to a poisonous snake, oh mm. shit! Becky was able to get some much needed rest. Little did she know, that rest would have to sustain her for the next 48 hours. Day four, it's been a pretty brutal start. Um, I ran into some wind storms um, and some parallel waves at the beginning of the day. 
got up earlier than usual. I uh, hit the water about 6 o'clock. I am incredibly tired from the morning travel. It's going to be a digging deep, digging deep moment. Ten miles separate me from being the first person to ever cross the lake in a kayak. They're going to be a brutal 10 miles. I'm really tired. Well, here I go. So I've made it to the top. Um, when I first landed, the wind was kicked up to I have no idea how many miles an hour. And, uh, but I caught a wave and literally surfed into my destination, which turned out to be a giant sandbar, which I will now show you. It would be more accurate to say that it's a giant salt bar. Everything I've touched or sat next to, and even the ground that I'm walking on, desolate salt chunky it's almost like snow or the salt flats or something not the snow the salt flats or something and the waves are so different than they now than they were when i first came in i was getting three and four foot waves that were pushing me in and then i sat and waited for an hour through what was i guess a microburst or something because there was huge plumes of gray sky and rain and awfulness and uh, I don't see any of that now, it's sunny. I don't think I can stay here tonight. There's no shelter of any kind against wind and there's no rocks to properly set up my tent. So I think what I'm going to do is stay for another hour and then probably get right back into my boat and head back to Black Rock, which is across Spring Bay and uh, camp there tonight, which sucks because that means that I have to go somewhere around nine miles with the wind coming at me. So if it decides to kick up crappy again, I'll, I'll have to face it coming head on instead of it coming from behind, which was one advantage of those crazy waves. It was like getting a little push into shore it was a scary push because it was pushing me different ways and I thought for a second I was going to flip but there was one point that I was literally surfing right into shore it was wild I get why people ski surf now except for they can get out of their boat if something happens and I'm sort of in mine Anyway, uh, that's all for now. I just am relieved. A part of me is just so immensely overwhelmed by how protected I've been this trip. It's been horribly exhausting. My elbow is starting to really kick in. The uh, That stupid tennis elbow. But... I just feel like I was cradled in the hand of the Lord. <sighs> it's beautiful here. Desolate, but beautiful. I kind of wonder if anybody's ever seen where I'm standing right now. I'm sure someone has. Just maybe not someone who was standing at the other side of the lake four days previously. tried to go back out again and I got about halfway out and the winds picked up so badly that it literally turned my boat around and shot me back to shore and I I prayed the entire time that I was in those wave conditions because the waves had gotten to six foot uh, that I wouldn't tip the boat and die because there's no way I could have endured 
falling out of the boat under those conditions. Uh, the wind was so strong and the water is so heavy it would have smacked me under. Anyway, I, I was able to get back to shore after that and the wind died down again and I thought, well, I'll just try again. At that point, I think it was 8 o'clock at night and it was dark and I hit a sandbar and couldn't get off of it. And by that point, uh, I figured I would just sleep in the boat. But I was in the boat, I think until about 11, maybe 12. And I was wet and I could start to feel myself shivering pretty badly. And I knew I couldn't stay in the boat. I, I needed to be in a place where I could get warm. So I stuck my boat in what I thought would be a good spot and it turned out that uh, that wasn't a very good spot. I'm heading out to try and find Beck. She got away from her boat at one point so and now she can't find her boat. It's 1.43 a.m. So I'm going to see what I can do to try and find her. I've got two hours to drive to get to her. Let's just hope for a miracle. You made it to the top. <laughs> we tried to retrace the steps I took with the GPS to see if my boat was where I'd left it. And it turned out it was nowhere near where I left it. And at that point I realized that I probably lost my boat and this journey was over. When surges happen like that, it can change the water about three feet in depth. And it's some sort of bizarre displacement of water. After hours of searching and walking for 10 miles through the salt encrusted landscape, we finally found Becky's boat, three miles away from where she had left it. Uh, after that, um, I got back in the boat and for the first couple of hours it was just fighting I don't know, it wasn't too bad current and it wasn't too bad wind, so I figured, ah, no worries. But about halfway through Spring Bay, the wind really started to kick up and I got waves similar to the ones that I had the night before. And I was, between the wind and the current, it took me almost eight hours to do 10 miles. That's ridiculous. I looked at my GPS at about 8.30 last night and realized there was just no way I was going to make Spiral Jetty. There's just no way. The wind was coming from the south, so I started looking for places on the shoreline. I would have I been about seven miles out from Spiral Jetty. and. I just prayed that I could get to where I needed to go. I got out of the boat and figured maybe I would just do the seven miles on top of the 18 or so miles that it was back to Promontory. And I dragged my boat on shore and I started looking for places to camp. And all of a sudden, the wind picked up really hard but there was a difference between how it was before this time it was coming from the north so it would push me south and the waves were tremendous but they after experiencing what I had at Spring Bay I was ready to fight against those waves because I knew I could endure them I knew that I could navigate them 
and surf them. So the waves came from the north and they literally surfed me all the way to Spiral Jetty. There was lightning and thunder. The lightning backlit the point. So I vaguely knew where I was going based on the silhouette. There is no way to describe the feelings I had last night when I landed. I had been paddling since 10 that morning. It was 12 at night. I was so spent. So when that wind came, I felt like, what a beautiful blessing. I had nothing left to go. I finished my last day of the north last night. Uh, rolled in on horrendous 30 mile an hour waves. <laughs> I love the north. There was enough foam. Like it looked like the sea was frothing at the mouth. And uh, it got my boat completely covered in froth. There's two more days left and it's, it's dropped considerable amount. It's funny to me because I, I think on day two or three it was 100 degrees outside and today I woke up and it was like 45 degrees. Yay! Um, wasn't expecting a variance of 50 degrees. <laughs> The only thing that drives me is that inner fire to, to finish this so that I can say that I crossed an inland sea. That's, that's all I want to be able to do at the end of this and make my pain from the north worth the expense that it, it took out of me, the, worth the tears because I've definitely had some rough days out there. So I've made it back to Fremont Island and I retrieved my beloved Ramses, the ram. I don't want to get grotesque, but after sitting for seven days in salt water that is extremely abrasive to the pores, I have developed some really nasty boils. So sitting is actually painful in that boat. It's very painful, especially since I'm constantly rocking back and forth on my butt. I'm like, holy doodle, this freaking hurts! Back on Animal Island, there was a sense of security. Becky had one more day of paddling left, 20 some odd miles through familiar water where rescue and cell phone coverage was abundant. Becky was on her way back home. It started with a simple idea to paddle the length and back of an inland sea. It wasn't about being first, but being just crazy. And through moments of frustration and doubt, and moments of pure elation. The journey became an adventure of a lifetime.
Jaw sweet and roach. No, I'm not even kidding you. There is pretzel salt in the fur of my arm. It's <laughs> disgusting. I'll be great. <laughs> Big bug. That was the biggest bug I've ever seen. <laughs> it's like a small horse on my leg. Apparently, I can move like this. The hills are alive. Just kidding. We're about to launch the sea wolf. Salt wolf. <laughs> <laughs> so my ghetto hole in the shoe, it's working brilliantly. <laughs> so if you have wider feet than your shoe, you just cut that shoe. <laughs> it works. Although, I think old ladies do that for their bunions. <laughs> well, you are 30. There you go. Old lady, old lady coming through. <laughs>